Hello, Petal. How you doing? I've had a good morning so far. I have baked myself some peanut butter cookies. Seriously, a little bit of cinnamon into the sugar mix. Oh, delightful. Anyway, I digress. Thank you for joining me again, whether it be morning, evening or night. And hello to everybody who's coming back. Thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me. Talking of which, I'm going to do the usual. So if you are enjoying it, please hit that like button. It helps me no end, um, as does the notifications bell, sharing and following if you'd like to. Um, anyway, we are back for The Better Mousetrap by... Tom Holt, which is J.W. Wells and Co. Book 5. No AI here, human being only. <laughs> and this is going to be chapter 3. Now, I have talked to my lovely Kiwi friend Rose and I've talked to my Australian friends as well. Um, yes, they, they have very much... <laughs> they, seriously, my Australian friend was like, you know when people are trying too hard? I'm like, yeah, I know exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> So please excuse my Australian accent, but I have been um, pointed in the direction of various <laughs> Australian comedians who I've been chuckling at this morning. Anyway, too much waffle. <laughs> um, right, so The Better Mousetrap, J.W. Wells and Co. Book 5, please excuse the accents, Chapter 3. <laughs> Oh, grown up face. <laughs> okay. Chapter three. She knew she'd come to the right address when she saw the young man. He was tethered to the reception desk by one of those plastic covered bicycle chains, and the red glow of shame from his cheeks was bright enough to toast cheese. Excuse me, she asked him, but is this amalgamated extrusions? The young man looked wretchedly at her and shuddered. Shall I? he mumbled. She nodded. You're the sacrifice, aren't you? Yeah. She thought. Traditionally, it should be a young woman, but this is the 21st century. Did it make him feel any better to know that he was an equal opportunity sacrifice? Probably not. Of course, it didn't say anywhere in the Book of Rules that the sacrifice had to be a girl. The only requirement was that it should be a ver... Soon have you out of here, she said briskly. You just hang on, keep very still, and everything's going to be fine. Now, where can I find Mr O'Leary? He frowned. You're the... what's it? The... um... Oh dear, <laughs> I'm from Carrington's, she said. Emily Spitzer, pest control. Do you think you could ring through to Mr O'Leary and let him know I'm here? The young man whimpered softly. Emily looked at the security chain and compared its length with the distance to the phone on the desk. <laughs> Obviously you can't, she said. Do you happen to know his extension number? Six, the young man mumbled. Thanks. Surely the whole point of a sacrifice was that it should be something you'll miss when it's gone. Otherwise it's simply not entering into the spirit of the thing. She poked in the number. Mr O'Leary, Emily Spitzer, Carrington's, I'm in your front office. About time. Sorry? I said about time. I called your people two hours ago. That may be your idea of a prompt, efficient service, but it bloody well isn't mine. Mr O'Leary wasn't to gnaw because he was sitting in his office six floors up. If he'd be done in reception, the look on Emily's face would have told him that he'd just done a very silly thing, on a par with walking up to a group of off-duty paratroopers in a pub just before closing time and asking them why they were wearing those poncy little red hats. So sorry, Mr O'Leary, she said sweetly. I got here as soon as I could. If you could just switch on the system, I can get started. The fawn went dead. She put the receiver back, stepped away from the desk, and turned to face the ventilation grill in the wall. Somewhere, far away, a fan began to spin. Emily unzipped her bag and counted under her breath. She got as far as six when the plasterboard surrounding the grill exploded into dust and rubble and something really rather horrible burst out of the ventilation shaft, hung in the air for a moment, and slithered down from the hall onto the desk. It's just as well that hydras are mythical creatures and don't really exist. 
If there really were such things, mankind would have to find a way of coping with a species of giant snake, nearly five times longer and thicker than an anaconda or a boring old boar constrictor, and equipped with somewhere between forty and a hundred heads, each attached to the main trunk by a separate neck, the way grapes connect to the bunch. The number of heads would vary, because if you were misguided enough to try and kill the wretched thing by cutting off her head, two more would instantly sprout in its place. Luckily for the human race, the Hydra is just a Dark Age myth, symbolising winter or red water fever in livestock, or possibly the kind of problem that just gets worse when you try and solve it. The sacrifice squealed and started tucking frantically at the lock-up chain, which was only looped around the leg of the desk. Keep still, Emily snapped. It was fortunate that the sacrifice was the kind of young man who was far more scared of girls than he is of ferocious mythical monsters. He did as he was taught. The trick is, of course, to attack strengths, not weaknesses. Emily popped the lid off the aerosol spray and lifted it. The Hydra was holding perfectly still, waiting for her to come within striking range. Mythical or not, it was a snake, capable of moving blindingly fast, inherently practical enough not to waste its energy in a non-viable target. Stay six feet away and you're safe. Five feet and you're a paragraph in the obituaries column in the trade paper. Calmly, because hydras are very good indeed at picking up on fear, Emily shook the can. The rattle of the little ball bearing was disconcertingly loud in the dead silence. Only a mug tries to deal with an enemy that has an average of 70 self-replicating heads by pruning it. A sensible and experienced person, a professional, takes the view that 70 heads means 140 eyes, and that her best friend, therefore, was her spray can of mace. I suggest you shut your eyes, Emily told the sacrifice. She couldn't look round to see if he'd obeyed because of the need to maintain eye contact with the Hydra. Try it sometime, by the way. A ratio of 70 to 1. Keep it up for more than 10 seconds and you'll completely redefine your concept of headaches. Very gradually, she lifted the can until the nozzle was level with the approximate centre of the thicket of heads. Schedule D to Section 34A of the Endangered Monsters Conservation Order 1998 requires that once a hydra has been blinded with an approved spray, as defined in Schedule D Part 2, Paragraph D43, parentheses, 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 it's the responsibility of the licensed control practitioner to immobilise it as quickly as possible with a permitted tranquilizer administered by injection or intravenous drip. The hydra should then be removed within two hours, three hours in Wales, Northern Ireland and the Isle of Man, to a holding pen constructed in accordance with the specifications set out in Schedule E Part 6 to await relocation to a designated hydra reserve. The only exception provided for in the regulations is bona fide scientific or medical research, in which case it's permitted to pump 20 cc's of liquid slaymore into it and hide behind a pillar until it stopped thrashing about. The Pest Control Department of Carrington's is on record as being engaged in a long-term research project into hydrotoxicology. Their aim is to find out how much slaymore it takes to kill the buggers, and as far as they're concerned, if you want to end up with good science, there's no such thing as too much data. It's all right, Emily said, peering around the edge of the pillar. You can open your eyes now. Is it? Yes. Oh. It wasn't fair, she told herself, to expect ordinary normal people to be brave. There's a good reason why fear is included in the package of software bundled with every new human being, and a world full of heroes simply wouldn't function. Even so, it'd be nice one of these days to meet a civilian who didn't fear or freeze or wet himself while she was in action. For one thing, it'd imply that he trusted her to do the job. Somehow... She couldn't help thinking it'd be different if it had been Ricky Wormtorder or Kurt Longfist or Christian MacDonald wielding the mace can in the big syringe. That said, there was no call to go taking out her sense of general grievance on the public. It's all right, she said, in her best approximation to a calm, soothing voice. I know it was scary and horrid, but it's all over now, and for crying out loud, stop that ridiculous snivelling. 
For the record, Emily had had seven boyfriends, none of them for long. The most recent had been a six-foot-eight rugby international. She hadn't been particularly surprised to discover that he was terrified of spiders in the bath. She rang Mr O'Leary. All done, she said crisply. Clean up will be along in about an hour. Don't let anybody touch anything until they've gone if you value your no claims owned. <laughs> You'd better get someone down here with the key to the bike lock and some Dettol and a sponge. I'm probably not a very nice person, Emily reflected as she rattled back to the office on the tube. A nice person would have drawn that poor boy's little accident to the attention of his ignorant pig of an office manager. And it's all very well to say that a nice person wouldn't be in this line of business, but <laughs> does that necessarily follow? Or am I the only saying it because I'm not nice? She shook herself like a wet dog. Niceness, she decided, wasn't everything. The lad she entered the front desk was probably extremely nice, and, if she was honest with herself, she found it hard to believe that he and she belonged to the same species. Emily filled in the operations report and the travel expenses voucher and attached them to her timesheet with a paper clip. Wednesday. On Wednesday, she usually had lunch with Marcia and Jane from Snetterton's at the pizza place in the Strand, but Marcia was on holiday, and she couldn't stand Jane if Marcia wasn't there to hold her lead. Am I really not a very nice person? She wondered. Surely not. I have friends. Jane. Marcia. It occurred to her that she didn't actually like either of them very much. One was a bitch and the other one was silly. That particular blend of calculate and frivolity that made you feel uncomfortable all the time. There was something gritty and sharp-eyed about Marcia when she was being silly. She was as sinister as a clown. All right, she conceded to herself. I may not like my friends very much, but my friends like me. They couldn't like me if I wasn't basically a nice person. I have redeeming qualities. I'm calm, level-headed, sensible, honest, realistic. I tell it how it is. I don't muck about. I have standards. She played that last bit back. Dear God, she thought. Not that it mattered. Emily had known way back in college that if she intended to make a career for herself in pest control, she was going to have to be single-minded about it. There would be sacrifices. Suddenly she thought of the skinny young man standing on his patch of damp carpet. She smiled. In pest control, all work and no play meant you might just stand a chance of staying alive long enough to get your money's worth out of a month's rent paid in advance. If you were really diligent, committed, focused and determined... You might even contrive to get the job done and still have your licence at the end of it. In spite of the vast accumulation of brain-pulping Byzantine regulations that you had to comply with in order to slay monsters legally, that kind of commitment didn't leave much time for anything else. There was even a saying in the trade, you can't get a life and take one too. Eight years of that sort of thinking does things to a person. These days, if she had a feminine side, it was probably the goddess in her aspect as Kali the Destroyer. Which reminded her, credit control meeting with Dave Hook at 3.15. Bugger, my cup runneth over, Emily thought, and little dripples are trickling down inside my sleeve. Dragons can burn you or flay your life with their claws. Manticores can shred your face with a flick of their tongues. Harpies excel at fly-by scalpings, and their prehensile six-fingered tails can slice the top of your head off like a boiled egg and dip soldiers in your brain. All Dave Hook could do was look at you and go, Tut. I'm brave, Emily thought. Really, I am. But the little voice in her head said, No, you're not. Not really. Bravery is defined as facing up to the things that really scare you. Monsters can kill you, but this man can take away your job. Mr Hook put down the spreadsheet, looked at Emily over the top of his glasses and frowned. He said. She winced. You're doing the work, he said. No question about that. Everything bang up to date. First class turnaround time. Outstanding feedback from the clients, but those bills just aren't getting sent out, are they? No, um, we're in this business to make money, after all. Um, there's no point doing the work if we don't get paid for it, is there? Um, Mr Hook sighed. 
and glanced sideways at the framed photograph on his desk. Mr Hook never talked about his family, but the woman in the picture was twenty years younger than him and looked as though she'd just stepped off a catwalk. There was also a small nondescript female child and a dog. It seems to me, he said, that we've had this conversation before. Isn't that right? Um, I have an idea that last time you promised me you'd make a real effort to get the invoices written up and sent out on time. Pause. His eyes were eaten into Emily's soul like shipworms gnawing a keel in the middle of the Sargasso Sea. Uh, that is what we agreed, isn't it? Um, sorry, I didn't quite catch. Yes, only Emily added quickly, in a teeny tiny voice that made her sound about the same age as the kid in the photograph. There's been ever such a lot to do this month, and I try to keep on top of the paperwork, but it's not always easy, and I get confused about what's zero rated for VAT and what isn't, and every time I sit down and try and do the apportionments, the phone always rings, and it's someone with a dragon or a chimera or something, and you can't keep the clients waiting, and by the time I get back to the office, it's been driven right out of my head, and her words trailed off, like the last few drips from a punctured water bottle in the desert. Mr. Hook looked at her. Sorry, she said. Those eyes, like those of a crucified spaniel. Sorry, really isn't good enough, though, is it? We really are going to have to buck our ideas up, aren't we? This time, when we promise faithfully that we're going to try and do better, we're going to have to mean it, aren't we? Pause. Oh, God. Emily thought, he's about to be nice. I can't stand it when he's nice. It's like having your raw soul scoured with a wire brush. I do understand, really, said Mr. Hook. You're a hard-working, dedicated young woman who never gives less than a hundred and ten percent. The profession isn't just a job of work to you. It's a passion. I think that's wonderful. I genuinely do, but... He stopped and looked at her. That how-do-you-solve-a-problem like Maria looked that made her feel... That was the wicked, cruel, unbearable thing about Mr. Hook's eyes. He could make her feel sweet. When his eyes latched onto her like that, suddenly she was a twelve-year-old girl who'd handed in twenty sides of homework that still didn't manage to answer the question. He made her feel like she was playing at the job. Indulging herself, instead of doing what she was paid for. Of course, if they'd hired a man. Now then, said Mr Hook, we really have got to sort this out, haven't we? I'm going to give you one last chance. Bills properly drawn up, sent in on time, credit control procedures carried out properly. You know you can do it if you try. After all, you're a highly intelligent girl, and it's just paperwork. If you're having trouble with the VAT apportionments, get Clive or Sarah to help you. I'm sure they'll only be too happy to show you how to do it. Get into the habit of setting aside a little bit of time every day, an hour and a half should be plenty, to really get a grip on those invoices and timesheets and yellow slips. Talking of which, I gather we've been a bit careless about filling out stores requisitions, haven't we? Emily nodded. Left undone those things which we ought to have done, and there is no health in us. I really don't want to make a big issue out of this, said Mr. Hook, concentrating a billion megawatts of disapproval into the pinpoint lasers of his eyes. But we really can't go on taking stuff out of the stores without signing for it. Let's see now. Twelve kilos of Slaymore, seven packets of detonators, nine boxes of rubber bands, three boxes of Semtex. It's not just the materials themselves, it's the time and effort it takes to get the books straight at the end of the month. And then, of course, we've got the licensing and the HSC inspections. And it's really getting rather awkward, trying to account for the discrepancies. It may seem like a lot of fuss to you but it's costing us a lot of money and causing some serious difficulties for us with the authorities. Just because you can't be bothered to fill in a few forms and write things down in the book. You do see that, don't you? 
That was, of course, the worst part of it. Emily could see. When she thought about it calmly, once the red mist had lifted and the urge to kill and kill and keep on killing had dissipated enough to let her brain start working again, she understood perfectly. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would slay monsters for fun. We do it for the money, and we don't get paid unless we send out a bill. And yes, of course we have to keep the stock books and the registers straight if we don't want the health and safety people and the deaf reborkies coming down on us like a tongue of bricks. Hardly rocket science. It was just... She slammed into her office, threw her bag at the wall, crashed into her chair and did the long, silent scream. Once upon a time, she could clear her mind just by imagining Mr Hook being torn apart by goblins... But that didn't work any more. No matter how vividly she pictured the scene, these days she tended to see the severed head's lips move and hear the calm, sad voice saying, But you know I'm right, don't you? And yes, he was right. Right, 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 right. And yes, you can't eat unless you do the washing up first. And her room would be so much more comfortable if she tidied it occasionally. And yes, she'd be able to find things if they weren't all piled up on the floor in a heap. And yes, they'd have much better off if they'd hired a man to do her job. Even if he'd been useless and she was the best damn dragon slayer in London. And quite possibly the whole of Europe. And yes, of course she'd do it all. Every invoice, yellow slip and station requisition voucher. If only he'd bloody well stop telling her to. It's me, isn't it? Emily thought. I just don't like doing as I'm told. How silly is that? And I get really angry when people don't do what I tell them, because it's stupid. If I say, don't go in there, it's dangerous, and they don't listen and they come out covered in boils or a different species, of course I'm bloody furious, because how could anybody be so dumb? But for some reason, when it's me... Deep breathing, calm, inner peace. And when I've done that... I'll go out and kill something big and scary with enormous teeth, and that'll make me feel better. It always does. Query, how would I be able to motivate myself to do this job if I didn't have Dave Hook? <laughs> Good question. Don't go there. Emily took a deep breath. It didn't work. She took another, and six more, and one more for luck. Then she got up, dragged an armful of files out of the cabinet, dumped them on the desk, and reached for her calculator. Sodding apportionments. Slaying monsters was zero rated, but you had to charge VAT on materials used, apart from safety equipment and books, and anything that habitually stood upright on two legs, vampires, zombies, orcs, goblins, and balrogs were a bit of a grey area, was classed as humanoid, and didn't count as a monster for VAT purposes, which meant that it had to be charged for. Werewolves were just a complete pain. Generally speaking, they were quadrupeds when you killed them. Bought, they reverted to human shape in the split second before they died, which meant you had to add VAT at 8.75%, unless you killed them with a slow-acting poison such as silver nitrate, in which case the rate decreased from 17.5% by one percentage point per day for the period between the first administration of the poison and the actual date of death. And as for shapeshifters, the fawn rang. Emily whimpered and picked it up. Mr Gomez for you. What? Uh, oh, right. Put him on. Click. Pause. Then. Emily? Yes? Job for you. Naturally. Like bloody magic. The moment she picked up a calculator, someone had a job for her. Can it wait? Only I've got mounds and mounds of paperwork and... Emergency, Colin said. I'm at the client's place now, as a matter of fact. Actually, he said, lowering his voice a little. It's the client's mother-in-law. You know Stan Lazak, don't you? No. Who the hell is... CEO of Dragoman Software Solutions. Oh. Yes, definitely an emergency in that case. What seems to be the... Can't talk now, Colin interrupted. Just get over here quick as you can. It's at... Uh... He gave her an address in one of the more opulent West London suburbs. Emily jotted it down on the nearest file cover. Look, she said, you need to tell me what it is so I'll know what stuff to bring. Like, if it's harpies, I'll just want slay more. But if it's a 30-foot high one-eyed giant, I'll need the 105 millimeter recoilless rifle. Don't worry about that. They've got everything you'll need right here. Yes, but click 
Bzzz, bastard. Colin Gomez was intellectual property, entertainment and media, so it was only to be expected that his grip on reality was one fingertip hooked over the edge of a very tall cliff. Even so, if there was one thing that really annoyed Emily, it was a complete lack of consideration for other people. Everything you'll need right here. Yeah, sure, but just in case. She slid open the drop drawer of her desk and took out a little canvas pouch. She held it for a moment before dropping it in her bag, as if drawing strength from it. Then she scribbled a note to say where she was going, and left the room. At least, with Drago Man foot in the bill, she could take a taxi rather than battling over there on the tube. As the embankment shuffled smoothly by outside the taxi window, Emily closed her eyes and tried to figure out what she'd be most likely to find when she got there. Of course, if it was an entertainment and media job, there was absolutely no way of knowing. In M Magic was typically flamboyant, wide dispersal and highly temperamental. If a reality fiction interface had blown, for example, you could be up against any bloody thing. Dinosaurs, skyscraper climbing gorillas, space aliens, you name it. Those cowboys in e and could contrive a way of getting it over the line and letting it get away from them. A faulty glamour was just as bad. A year or so back, some pinhead in media R&D had developed a sort of cap thing that turned the wearer into whatever he truly wanted to be. Marvellous idea in theory, but if you go on to make stuff like that, you really can't go cutting costs at the production stage. If you do, sooner or later something's going to jam, some poor bugger's going to stick like it, and suddenly you've got a junior home office minister swooping low of a white hole on a 30-foot wingspan, shooting out jets of green fire from both nostrils. And Colin reckoned they got everything she'd need right there. <laughs> Absolutely which was why she'd brought the lifesaver, otherwise known as the Mordor army knife. Strictly speaking, she wasn't really supposed to have one, since it had been made in the forges of the Dark Lord and counted as an instrument of darkness. But it had everything. As well as the usual penknife, screwdriver, bottle opener and combination wire stripper and fingernail breaker, there was a siege tower, a battering ram, a folding heliograph, a scaling ladder, a high-velocity ballista capable of knocking holes through ten feet of solid rock, a caltrop dispenser, a six-dragon power welding torch and a pair of scissors that you could actually cut things with. Furthermore, it didn't belong to the firm. It was her very own, which meant she didn't have to ride out three pink jits and a yellow requisition every time she wanted to use it. Pull up at the top of the road, Emily told the driver. I'll walk the rest of the way. An important lesson, once she'd learned the hard way, unless you know exactly what's waiting for you at the other end, don't jump straight out of a cab and onto Grand Zero. There are all sorts of things you notice from a hundred yards away that might escape your attention if you're too close. Wrecked cars, burning trees, a six-ton adult griffin perched on a neighbouring rooftop. As she walked slowly and quietly down Chesterton Drive, however, there didn't appear to be anything to see, and her feather-edged professional intuition wasn't picking up anything in the way of bad vibes. She could always tell when something was wrong, but here... Everything seemed to be exactly as it should have been. In which case... You know you're a professional when the hairs on the back of your neck start to crawl precisely because everything feels... right. She rang the doorbell. Big Ben chimes, which set her teeth on edge. An elderly woman in an Edinburgh Woollen Mills cardigan opened the door and smiled at her. Yes, dear... Emily frowned. I'm sorry, she said. I think I've come to the wrong house, only... Behind the woman, Colin suddenly materialised. He was one of those men who managed to be very tall without achieving anything in the way of stature. There you are, he said, in a voice that suggested that he'd had a long and uncalled-for day. I was wondering where you could have got to. This is Mrs Thompson. This is Emily Spitzer, who works with me at the office. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd better be making tracks. <laughs> Clients coming in at 4.30, I mustn't keep them waiting. 
Colin slipped past Mrs. Thompson and disappeared up the path in a sort of coherent blur. He was just in time to catch up the taxi she had arrived in. In and people could do that sort of thing. It was very impressive, until you realised that it was no more than the power of applied arrogance harnessed through a few simple forks and techniques. If you sincerely believed the world was there entirely for your convenience and you knew the magic words, more often than not it turned out that you were right. Bastard, she thought. He could at least have hung around long enough to brief her on what needed doing, instead of leaving her to extract the information slowly and tactfully from someone who was quite definitely the public. She hated all that, trying to explain things in terms that lay people could understand and which wouldn't blow their minds. She took a deep breath. What seems to be the problem? she said. What, dear? Oh, yes, it's Barney. Barney, my cad. Your. Didn't Mr. Gomez explain? Poor Barney has got himself stuck in the apple tree in the back garden, and I'm so worried he might fall out and hurt himself. For perhaps as long as a second and a half, the world seemed to flicker. At first it felt as though nothing was real, as though Emily was standing in the void waiting for the creator to turn up. And then there was anger. Your cat is stuck up a tree, she said. That's right, dear. Yes, now, Mr. Wilcox at number 16 has got a ladder but he may have gone out it's his day at the clinic but mrs palladio at number 12 might have one only i don't know her terribly well she only moved in a few months ago or i suppose you could try john at number 24 excuse me yes dear and then she thought no i don't destroy old ladies even old ladies with cats, because in the final analysis, they aren't the real enemy. I shall be as nice as I possibly can to the old bat. I might even rescue her bloody cat. And every precisely quantified milligram of niceness I expend on her will be another red-hot skewer with barbed wire wrapped around it when I get back to the office and see Colin. Emily smiled. That's all right, she said. Just leave it to me and everything will be just fine. Mrs. Thompson pursed her lips. Are you sure? Because you can read eyes after a year or two in the profession. Because, after all, you're only a girl. I'd have thought Mr. Gomez would have got a man to do it, after all, climbing up ladders. <laughs> Emily broadened her smile. All the king's horses, Colin, she thought, and all the king's men. Why don't you show me where the tree is? And then go and make us both a nice cup of tea. That must have been the right thing to say, because Mrs. Thompson nodded and led the way through the house and into the back garden. There, sure enough, was an apple tree, with a fat ginger blob sticking like used chewing gum to one of the spindly upper branches. Are you sure you don't want to borrow Mr. Wilcox's ladder, dear? No, I'll be fine. Now, how about that cup of tea? This won't take a moment. You will be careful, won't you? Only Barney can be a little bit wary of strangers. Emily waited till the back door was safely shut. Then she took the Mordor army knife out of her bag, thumbed out the scale and ladder attachment, dropped it on the ground and jumped back. She didn't know how it worked and couldn't have cared less, but she'd learned the hard way to give it plenty of room. The little metal thing, like a comb which she had hooked out of the body of the knife, seemed to blur for a moment, as though it had gone out of focus. When it resolved itself again, it was a twenty-foot aluminium ladder. She frowned at it and said, Shorter. The adjustment was instantaneous. When she picked up the ladder, it was warm, just about bearable to the touch. She leaned it against the nearest substantial branch to where the cat was, wiggled it about a bit to check it was stable, and began to climb. Here, Kitty, she said through gritted teeth. She wasn't a cat person, in the same way a petrol doesn't have a soft spot for naked flames. The cat, which was licking its paw, lifted its head and looked at her. Don't start, she said grimly. The cat's left ear flickered. She felt her tights catch on a projecting twig. Colin Gomez, she promised to herself, was going to spend the rest of his abbreviated life 
paying for this. Three more rungs, and Emily reckoned she was in comfortable grabbing range. She put together a plan of action. Left hand off rung, reach out, form grip on cat's collar, secure cat firmly under left arm, then back the way we came. No bother. The key to success would be smooth, controlled movements. The cat hissed at her and stood up, its tail stiff and straight as a pine tree. At this point, it occurred to her that all her training and experience had been directed towards killing animals rather than saving them, which was fine, bearing in mind the sort of animal she tended to deal with. But maybe, in this case, she was a trifle out of her depth. She glanced over her shoulder to see if Mrs Thompson had emerged from the house. No sign of her. And she wouldn't be able to see what was going on at the tree from her kitchen window. <laughs> she grinned. Go on, she said. Make my day. The cat made a growling noise it had inherited from ancestors who hunted mammoths for a living and edged a little further along its branch. Emily recognised the tactic. Deliberately fall off, get yourself killed, land me in serious trouble with your owner, the feline equivalent of suicide bombing. All domestic animals are terrorists at heart. The secret is, never negotiate. Go on, she said to the cat. You fall off if you want to. I've got reflexes like a snake. I'll catch you by your tail or something. It'll hurt like hell and I'll have won. Or you can hold still. We can go back down together in comfort. And then I can go back to the office and make Colin Gomez eat his own legs. <laughs> you decide your choice. Oh, and by the way, the knife's got a built-in safety field extending three feet in all directions from its base. So, even if I miss you, you'll just bones. So go for the big gesture if you want to, but it won't do you any good. When you talk to animals, it's all in the tone of voice. The cat gave Emily a look of quiet disgust and walked calmly along the branch until it was well outside her reach. Then it made a sort of chirruping noise and started washing its ear with the back of its paw. Emily sighed. You don't negotiate, and when they raise your stakes, you don't back down. Carefully, she took one foot off the ladder and poured the empty air until she felt something reasonably solid under her sole. Gradually, she applied weight until she was satisfied it wasn't going to break off and repeated the procedure with her other foot. It was, she realised, a bit like going after nesting harpies in a bell tower, except that there was a better choice of footholds and she wasn't burdened with cumbersome heavy weapons. On the other hand, there was plenty of tree left for the cat to move to. She thought about the knife safety field. She knew it was there because she'd read about it in the owner's guide, but she'd never actually had occasion to put it to the test. How high up was she exactly? Twelve feet? Fifteen? She thought of something else she could say to Colin Gourmets, and the thought gave her the strength to proceed. Equalising her weight on both feet, she reached out towards the cat's neck. It was only a few inches from her hand. She reached a little further and felt her elbow brush against a branch. There was a click, like a door opening. The tree disappeared. Fifteen feet up in the air, with nothing to hold on to except an absence of tree. Don't try this at home. <laughs> you could do yourself a mischief. Half a second later, the tree was back again, pretty much exactly as it had been. It had rotated through something like six degrees clockwise, which was an acceptable margin. Too late, of course, to do Emily any good, at a speed of 32 feet per second per second. The last thing she heard was her own neck snapping. A full two seconds later, the cat shimmered back into existence on its branch. It arched its back, yawned and scampered down the trunk, landing neatly and comfortably next to Emily's outstretched left arm. Sniff, sniff. Nothing to smell here, folks. With a slight wave of its tail, it walked lazily towards the back door and slid through the cat flap. Oh, well, if anything, that tells us if you're going to rescue a cat out of a tree, take appropriate safety measures and, and, yes. Well, I wasn't expecting that. No Australian accents in this one, or Kiwi accents. I think this is going to be an ongoing joke throughout this particular book, is just how awful my accents are. But I'm a bit concerned about Emily. I, I, I sincerely hope that she's able to recover from her rather... Uh, anyway, 
<laughs> we'll we'll find out about this in the next few weeks, I imagine. But um, let me know how you like it. Let me know how you're getting on with it. Um, always, if you've got any feedback, by all means, you're more than welcome to give me any feedback. You're more than welcome to leave a comment and say hello. I always like that. And thank you very much to everybody that does, because it always makes me smile. And yeah, I like our little teeny tiny community we got going here. It makes me very happy. And it shows me this is all worthwhile, which means an awful lot to me because books are life. Um, anyway, <laughs> let me know if you mind this waffle at the beginning and the end of the chapters. <laughs> I enjoy doing it. It's it's fun. It's just I, I don't want to be um, interrupting the, the reading, as it were. But I, I do like connecting with you guys. You've, you've been very awesome. And, you know, I appreciate you very, very much. So... So, have a good couple of days. I will be back with another chapter of The Better Mouse Trap by Tom Holt, J.W. Wells and Co. Book 5. And the next one we're going to be doing is Chapter 4. And I would imagine that'll be on Tuesday. Thank you, thank you very much for being here. Take it easy. Have a good couple of days. And I'll see you soon, Petal. <laughs>